Hey everyone, welcome to the New Market Alliance Church Podcast. If you wish to know more about us, please visit our website at newmarketalliance.ca. As the COVID pandemic comes to an end, we encourage you to come check us out in person if you can. No matter how good a podcast is, being in the company of people and experiencing the community of our church is much better. At Mac, we meet every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. You can expect free coffee, tea, snacks, a warm smile, and a friendly face. And with that, let's go ahead and listen to this week's sermon. In high school, I played a lot of sports. And I know I don't look like your typical jock, but uh, one year I actually did two sports per season and probably spent more time in practices and games than in class and in studying. And um, the sport that had the biggest effect on me, on my formation as a person, was wrestling. And yes, yes, I'm tiny, and that means I was in a weight category where there weren't a lot of contenders. But the few of us in the GTA who were serious about it were really serious about it. And there was always this steady flow of people in our weight category um, that would try out wrestling, like just come out to a tournament or two. But not a lot of them stuck around for years because, honestly, wrestling's not your typical fun of, like, volleyball or rugby. And that's because wrestling just keeps pushing you to your limits. And, you know, each session is only a couple of minutes long, but it feels like forever because you're running on adrenaline the whole time and you're giving everything you have. And oftentimes, during the match, you will feel exhausted, like completely empty and out of gas. And maybe, you know, you just got the wind knocked out of you. But don't take two seconds because then you'll lose. Um, Or maybe you just can't handle another second of a stinky armpit in your face. (laughs) Or you've twisted your body a lot to avoid getting pinned. Um, And it's a really uncomfortable position and your back is just pleading for you to give up. So if you don't like constantly expending all of your energy until you're almost at breaking point, then wrestling is not a sport for you. Um, But while you can't choose to do wrestling as a sport, you can't choose to not wrestle in life. You can't avoid facing tough things in life. And when you're tired of struggling and you come to a breaking point, then what do you do? How do you not break? What happens when you get to the point where you're empty? How do you keep going? This pandemic has taken a lot out of us. Some of us have suffered loss. Some of us are feeling empty. And as Christians, we believe that Jesus offers us abundant, full life. But how so when there seems to be a disconnect between our reality and that promise from God? Today, we're looking at a woman named Naomi who faced a lot of tough things in life. And frankly, she didn't wrestle with them well on her own because these tough things just straight up depleted her. But her life does turn around, and we're going to see how she goes from feeling empty to enjoying a life of fullness. Naomi's story is found in the book of Ruth and begins with her family moving away from home because there is famine in their land. Famine. Not fasting for a few days by your choice, not dieting so that you can look or be healthier. We're talking chronic food deprivation. And I have to admit, I've, I'm privileged. I haven't experienced chronic hunger, but I don't presume that all of you share my privilege. Maybe some of you know exactly what it's like to not know where your next meal is coming from. So you then do a better job than me um, at depicting chronic hunger, but I'll share what I know from my family. My grandma was a single mom, 
um, who couldn't afford to stop working after giving birth to my dad. And at that time, there was a shortage of infant formula in the country. So my dad had uh, rice water most days and soy milk on good days for four months of his life, as a, the first four months of his life. And it's a miracle that he survived because a lot of babies in his situation didn't, right? And, you know, that was 60 years ago and it all worked out, but my grandma is still traumatized. When she thinks about it, she cries, she can't talk about it. It's, she relives it when it comes to mind. Because it was really traumatizing for her to be hungry and also to watch her kid, her newborn, be hungry. Actually, statistics and neuroscience prove that chronic hunger can cause depression, anxiety, PTSD, and it's way worse when you see your kids go through severe hunger. So then consider how famine in the whole land can be psychologically traumatizing on another level because you're looking around and life is diminishing in everyone around you, everyone you know. That's what happens to Naomi. Now, like many people, in order to survive a famine, Naomi and her family travel a long distance to search for food elsewhere. And it doesn't feel like much of a choice. It's a desperate life or death situation that makes you feel forced to leave behind your people, your land, your culture. And feeling forced to give up everything you know and the community that makes you who you are is, again, traumatizing. So Naomi's family goes to Moab, which is actually enemy territory because the Moabites and Israelites don't get along. So you can imagine that behind this move is a lot of desperation, fear, and uncertainty. And well, Naomi's family must have found some food security in Moab because they settle there. But then Naomi's husband dies, and she loses her partner, her thick and thin. And since this was a patriarchal society, she also lost her provider of identity and security. And she would have had to depend on her sons now. But then they both die too. I can't even imagine the depths of grief that Naomi went to from losing her spouse and her kids in a matter of 10 years. They were her love and joy, her only family among a foreign people. And again, they were her sense of identity and security. After going through this constant loss and trauma, Naomi was depleted. How would she keep going? Let me take you back to the wrestling mat. Imagine you're at that point where you have nothing left in you, and your body telling you to give up is creeping into your mental game. Suddenly, you hear your coach's voice, and you just do exactly what your coach says. That's actually the best move you can make, and often becomes the turning point of the match in your favor. In that moment, actually, your brain often disagrees with what your coach is saying. But a good coach knows you and knows what you need to do to overcome your opponent better than you do. So you just have to trust your coach. And in life, your coach is God. And it is really hard to hear him clearly or to believe in him when negative thoughts in your head are so loud. But if you wait on God, he will indicate your next move, just as he did for Naomi. Naomi heard that God was giving his people food. So she got up with her daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, to return to Bethlehem. Even though Naomi followed God's cue, she wasn't exactly sure how this would pan out. Because the last time she traveled this road, it didn't work well at all on the other side. So at some point along the journey, Naomi decided 
Orpah and Ruth should just turn back and go back to their parents. But Orpah and Ruth cried and said they wanted to stay with Naomi and join her people. They really loved her. And you can tell how much they did because of how Naomi prayed for them. She said, May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The word kindly is the English translation for the Hebrew word chesed, which means the loving kindness, compassion, and grace that God gives. Chesed goes beyond moral obligation. Now, God extends chesed to us when he remains faithful even while we are unfaithful. And Naomi was saying that Orpah and Ruth had demonstrated that godly chesed to her and her family. Maybe they sacrificed a lot to marry Naomi's sons while they were outcasts in Moab. And then maybe they went above and beyond to care for them when they were sick and dying. And now Orpah and Ruth were willing to extend more chesed to Naomi by accompanying her return to a people who would likely ostracize them for being Moabites. So Orpah and Ruth really wanted to stay by Naomi's side. But Naomi kept pushing them away. Naomi went on and on about why she can't provide for them and how she felt bitter because God's hand was against her. And in hearing that, the ladies just wept. They, they wept loudly. And I imagine that they were grieving all the loss they had experienced together. And then Orpah finally kissed Naomi goodbye, while Ruth clung to Naomi. And Naomi urged Ruth a third time, just leave. And Ruth refused again. And this time, she makes a lifetime vow to stay committed to Naomi, to her people, and to her God. And at that, Naomi just gave up trying to convince Ruth to leave. But actually, if you look at the Hebrew, it says, Naomi stopped talking to Ruth. She didn't acknowledge Ruth's vow and say, oh, wow, like that's, that's so sweet. Thank you. I'm really touched. Naomi stayed quiet for the rest of the journey, probably retreating into her own thoughts, trying to process all the trauma she's been through. And she wasn't very aware of Ruth, who was supporting her. And when they got to Bethlehem, the woman of the city asked, Is this Naomi? And Naomi told them, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Of course, Naomi was referring to her husband and her sons. But she also said this with complete disregard for Ruth, who was right next to her. Sometimes we can be like that when we're going through a lot. We can withdraw into ourselves and push people away. Even those who have been our support system for years, like Orpah and Ruth were for Naomi. And on rare occasion, there might be a Ruth in your life. Someone who is just unwilling to leave your side. And even while we are completely absorbed in our own messy world, they understand. They stick around. And they continually support us without our appreciation. You know, that's chesed. And those people are God-sent. Another wrestling connection. Those people are your teammates. You won't see this at the Olympics, but at a high school wrestling tournament, your teammates get to sit around the mat or on the bleachers really close by. And when you're totally zapped in the middle of a match, there's nothing better than hearing the cheers of your teammates. But you can actually make a decision. You can decide to ignore their cheers or you can decide to let their cheers replenish your energy. And as soon as you decide to accept their cheers, you suddenly get a second wind. I hope some athletes here know what I'm talking about. So my point is that Orpah and Ruth were Naomi's teammates. They were processing their own grief 
from losing their husbands and then leaving their land. They had their own internal struggles, their own wrestling matches, but they were also there to walk with Naomi. They wanted to stick together, try and get through this together. But Naomi just refused to be helped, refused to be lifted out of her emptiness. If only she would recognize the love that they had for her. But Naomi's trauma and grief prevented her from accepting those who were on her side. And she even believed that God was against her and lamented about this to the women in her town. Have you ever contemplated whether God was against you? I know I have. And in one sense, it's true that God, who you'd expect to stay in your corner, might come onto the mat and wrestle with you. Some of you may know that the nation of Israel got their name from a wrestling match with God. That story is in Genesis 32, if you want to read that later. But here's the thing. Even when God wrestles with you, he's in it to build you up and not to destroy you. He's for you, not against you. God's ultimate will is to give us abundant life. When we feel empty, he is already working out a way to restore us to fullness. And the way he restores us to fullness is through our teammates, through our community. I'm going to go through the rest of Naomi's story a little differently now and highlight each part of the community that plays a role in being a network of support and the means through which Naomi becomes restored. First, there's Ruth. And in a sense, Ruth actually has more to wrestle with than Naomi, being a Moabite in Israelite land. But she does have youth on her side. Ruth knows they're not going to survive if they just sit at home. So she takes the initiative to seek support from the community. Ruth knows that among the Israelites, God set up a system whereby the needy can go and glean in somebody else's fields. So Ruth takes advantage of that, and she goes to glean. And Naomi just says three words to her. Go, my daughter. And stays behind at home. Now, since coming back, Naomi's probably been flooded with memories of how the place used to be filled with life kids running around, her husband coming home sweaty after a day's work, and she was probably really busy taking care of her whole family. And now, Naomi is alone in an empty home with her sad thoughts and an aching heart. And meanwhile, Ruth is out there laboring in the fields, and risking harassment so that she can feed Naomi and herself. I don't blame Naomi at all, but she was so blessed to have Ruth fighting for the both of them when Naomi had no fight left in her. Well, God leads Ruth to the fields of a wealthy man named Boaz, who not only lets her glean in his field, but he goes out of his way to care for her well-being. He connects Ruth with the other young women who are working in the field so that she would learn where to reap. She makes sure, he makes sure that the men would not harass her and tells them to leave behind grain for her to pick up. And Boaz offers her water and serves her food, even though Ruth is in the lower position and should have been getting water and food for him. Boaz even prays for Ruth and invites her to keep working in his fields until harvest is over. So as Boaz was, sorry, as God uses Boaz and Boaz's people to protect and to provide for Ruth, Boaz ends up playing a key role in Naomi's support network too. When Ruth returns home at the end of the day with all that she gleaned, plus some leftover food, Naomi finally perks up for the first time in the whole story. 
Naomi is so excited as Ruth tells her about working in Boaz's fields because Naomi knows Boaz is one of their redeemers, which means that Boaz is a male relative who could restore them and make them permanently secure by buying back their property and marrying Ruth. This is another system God set up among his people to look after the needy. And the fact that Ruth just happened to glean in Boaz's field allows Naomi to recognize God's hand is behind all of this. He's indicating their next move. All of a sudden, Naomi has hope for the future. Naomi understands that they need to get Boaz to redeem them. So she comes up with a plan. Naomi finds out that when harvest is over and Ruth's temporary work situation expires, Boaz will celebrate and sleep on the threshing floor. So that night, Naomi tells Ruth to make herself attractive, sneak in there after he's done eating and drinking, and propose marriage. It was pretty risky, but Ruth did it. You know, Boaz could have rejected her, humiliated her, harassed her, but he consistently proves to be a man of good character. He tells Ruth he's going to talk to another redeemer who's first in line, and if that guy refuses to redeem her, then Boaz will do it. And then Boaz gives her loads of barley to bring home to Naomi. What a stand-up guy. The next morning, Boaz goes to the city gate. This is the place where you'd make business decisions, legal decisions, and public announcements. And Boaz gathers the next group of people who are part of Naomi's community, the elders. They act as a legal court, as Naomi's redeemer first in line transfers over to Boaz the right to redeem her land and to marry Ruth. Then Boaz publicly announces his intention to continue the family line for Naomi's dead son and Ruth's first husband. And the elders and all the community leaders gathered around to serve as his witnesses. Then they go beyond that. And they pray for God's blessings upon Ruth, upon Boaz, and upon their offspring. You know, the elders and the community leaders at the city gate could have pushed back on the union of Boaz and Ruth. They could have cited a law from Moses' time that prohibited intermarriage between Israelites and Moabites. But rather than being intolerant of Ruth, and then leaving Naomi to be a destitute widow, they welcomed Ruth into the community and restored Naomi's position in society. So Boaz and Ruth got married, and God gave them a son. And the women in the town immediately gather around Naomi to celebrate with her. Earlier in the story, when Naomi and Ruth entered Bethlehem, and Naomi was lamenting and lamenting. Did you notice the woman just gave Naomi space and listened to her? Because that was the kind of support she needed at the time. Now that Naomi's received her first grandchild, it sounds like they're throwing her a baby shower, as per the Jewish tradition to do so after the baby's born. So just imagine Naomi's busy again with a baby, And her place is filled with girlfriends, encouraging her and blessing her. What a difference from the empty home earlier. These women not only pray for Naomi's grandson, but they even name him. And that's not normal. But it just goes to show how involved these women were in Naomi's life by that point. That they would do something so significant that usually only family does, which is to name the child. So you see, Naomi has gone from empty to full because every part of the community in Bethlehem lived as God called them to live. Well, okay, except for the Joshmo Redeemer, first in line, who relinquished his responsibilities to Boaz. But besides him, it seemed like the whole town 
of Bethlehem at this time was living according to the will of God, loving him and loving one another. And of course, we live in a broken world, and not every community is a perfect support network. But trust that God is always working in the background. And when you're empty, wait for his guidance. He will indicate your next move, which is always going to be toward a full life with him. And that happens in community. So besides waiting for God's guidance, seek the support of your community. Everybody has their own struggles, but we're meant to do life together and share our joys and our burdens with one another. If you're empty, don't stay empty by isolating yourself. You need to lean on others, and God will fill you up through them. Naomi was so blessed to have Ruth. Though Naomi didn't seek support for herself, Ruth committed to caring for her and ventured out to seek help in a foreign community. If Ruth hadn't accompanied Naomi to Bethlehem and then worked in the fields for months and then risked herself to propose to a man in the dark, Naomi's story may not have the same ending. God used Ruth's continual chesed toward Naomi to restore her. Which leads me to another point. For those of us who are not completely empty, I encourage you to be part of the community that supports the needy, to show chesed. Just as God partnered with Ruth and Boaz to extend chesed, God partners with us to bless others when we show chesed. Let me put it like this. Anyone who falls within the range of uh, the situation of a destitute widow um, and that of a wealthy business leader, you can show chesed. According to scripture, it is God's will. Micah 6, eight says, And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. That second line, kindness, is chesed. Compassion, grace, beyond moral obligation. The first line is justice, to do what is right, beyond legal obligation. And justice and chesed work in conjunction to care for the vulnerable, the hungry, the sick, the orphan, the widow, the foreigner, the oppressed. And all this justice and chesed flows out of us as we walk humbly with God, as we recognize that all we have is from Him, and that God's will for us is to be in community with Him and with others. I want to end by bringing us back to my wrestling days. I learned so much about wrestling in life because of my coach. He kind of has a story like Naomi, and maybe you know him, and you know his story. Mitch Chavallo, son of George Chavallo, Canada's, sorry, Canada's greatest heavyweight boxer. Coach Chavallo lost his three brothers and his mother to suicide and drug overdose in a matter of 12 years. But unlike Naomi, and more like Ruth, my coach is a fighter for life. He doesn't isolate himself. And he humbly shows chesed to those around him. I can confirm that God has used Coach Valo to show chesed toward me and to replenish me in my emptiest moments during high school. If you're empty now, I pray God will send you a Ruth, a Boaz, or a Chavalo your way. And may we together be a community that partners with God and showing chesed to one another within the church and beyond.